good evening and thank you very much everybody for uh, joining us. This is our, it's a uh, little class, but this is our second and last ash breaking of the 19, 18, 19 year. But thank you very much for coming. I think uh, we have a tremendous crowd here this evening. And I wonder if part of that is because the snow has melted. And hopefully this time it will stay melted. But yeah, no worries. Sunnier times outside, and uh, we're going through. Everybody else, I imagine, like myself, is uh, looking forward to a summer ahead. So again, thank you for being here this evening. I'd like to introduce the Board of Governors as well as the Executive. So if you could please rise when I call your name. Jacob Huff, Governor. Chris Brawley, Governor. Chris is not here with us this evening. Celine Marabo, Governor. Peter Shawwood, Governor, also not here with us this evening. Joe Delanau, Governor, and I believe Joe is also with us this evening. Adrian Matani is our Secretary. We have Adam Coons as the Treasurer. Aaron Dodson is our President elect. Adam Graham, who joined us last month but uh, has gone back to his old antics and has not joined us this evening. This is, he's our past president. And I, Daniel Redman, am your president for the 1819 chapter year. We have a number of guests with us this evening. We have some, some special visitors uh, from society as well as from Region 2. I would like to, uh, if you don't mind standing, I'd like to uh, acknowledge Bjarni Olison, who's the society president for 2017-18. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you very much for being here, Daniel. We have Maya Dow. She is the Region 2 RDC for Student Activities. Thank you very much for being here, Maya. And we have Jean-Pierre Lucier, who is the Region 2 RDC for Membership Promotion. Thank you very much for being here. Yes, I am a tool for you. Well, you continue that. You continue to grow through Ashley, 
and it helps you in your career, and it helps you in your socializing, and see how uh, what's going on in the industry. So I hope that for there was a list before of um, people that are not not members. So I hope that you come again and again and try to get that ash ashery feeling. We all have that ashery feeling as members, so we try to get you to get that ashery feeling and join us and, and continue in this great organization. So thank you very much for being here. And this month it's April, so it's the Member Recognition Month. So we're saying thank you to all members, and there's a small promotion for all the members, so you get a 15% discount on ASHRAE standards and everything that's in the bookstore. So that's a way for ASHRAE to say thank you for being a member. And if you have a member crush, what that means, if you're, there's a member you really like and you want to recognize that member, you can go on LinkedIn, on whatever social media you use, and you do hashtag member crush, and you speak about that member to recognize them and say, I, I enjoy working with you and thank you for introducing me to Ashley. And there's a raffle every end of the week, so you get cool member uh, membership and Ashley merchandise if you win. So again, I invite you to go to the Ashley website to see that. So thank you for being here and enjoy your week.
And that goal was to try and fund a scholarship such that we could give back to the community and we could recognize a young student who was pursuing a career in the HVAC industry and try to help support their education, try to get them encouraged to be part of ASHRAE, to be part of our industry. I'm pleased to announce, and in fact I've told people uh, previously, that we did manage to fully fund that scholarship last June. The commitment was we needed to fund it with a $60,000 commitment to society. Our scholarship is managed by ASHRAE Society, and there are currently 35 society scholarships that are administered globally. Five of these scholarships are chapter scholarships. So the Ottawa Valley Chapter is now one of those five scholarships around the world that is a society-level scholarship funded by a chapter. The others are, well, we have the Minnesota Chapter, the New Jersey Chapter, Central New York, Houston, and as of last June, the Ottawa Valley Chapter. The scholarship is available to full-time undergraduate, mechanical, architectural, sustainability, or building science, engineering, technology students. Enrolled in a program leading to a professional degree or advanced diploma in a field of study that has traditionally been a preparatory curriculum for the HVAC and our profession. The applicants must be in the top 30% of their class. And I'm delighted this evening to welcome Matthew Woods from Carleton University as the very first recipient of the Ashray Ottawa Valley Chapter Scholarship. Sustainable and Renewable Energy Engineering at Carleton University.
so with that, the nominations are closed. And uh, something I'm doing a little bit differently this year is to announce all of the committee chairs. Ashray is, actually volunteerism is very much like a funnel, and we introduce people very gently at the start to very small roles and let them see what they want to do, help them uh, find their way from a volunteering position, and as they spiral slowly down the Ashray funnel, uh, the pressure builds into a crushing god, just kidding. Uh, but the reality is, people who start out with very simple roles find out that this is something that they like, and if they do, they move on to greater roles, and something that starts to take on uh, a bit more significance is when you become the uh, chair of a certain committee. We have many committees, and it's a role that uh, takes a fair amount of time, a fair amount of uh, diligence, and can give you uh, an insight into where it works in the So uh, I want to mention these people specifically because it's uh, a level of commitment to the volunteerism that I think is really important. So uh, bear with me as I go down through the committees. Uh, for attendance, uh, financial and publicity, we have Sandy Taylor. For our audit committee, Adam Graham. Capital Communicate, uh, Evans Matuo. Our CRC committee chair is Aaron Dobson. CTTC would be Trevor Thompson. Our greeters uh, are uh, coordinated by Mike Swain. Honors and awards is Abby Sanders, the Saunders. Uh, History chair is Ryan Dickinson. Membership promotion, Andrew Brown. Uh, nominations, myself. PAOE and research promotion will be Adam Wiggles. Program committee, uh, which is the the biggest of them all, uh, Zarna Karadia. Special events uh, are headed by uh, Colleen Fox looking after our curling bonds deal, Rod Lansfield for our golf tournament, and uh, Michael Callahan for our bowling social. Student activities is chaired by Liz Primo, tabletop by David Michelin, website by Brian Dickinson, and Yay uh, is chaired by Jordan Hansen. Uh, the next level uh, it brings us to boards, governors, and the executives. So, this is where things get a little more serious. Uh, and this year, I'm very pleased to uh, announce that the executive will be headed up by Aaron Dobson. Our president-elect will be Adam Wounds. Treasurer, Adrian Matang. And I'm very, very pleased to say that Ryan Dickinson will be our secretary for the coming year. Past president will be chaired daily by uh, Dan Redmond. Our board of governors returning are Jacob Huff, Salim Darabo, Peter Shawwood, Joe Delaval, and uh, <laughs> new to the board, it will be Mike Swain, providing a uh, voice of reason and discourse for all the uh, youngsters on there showing us uh, the way. So, uh, thank you all who uh, were nominated. It, it's a great responsibility to take me off, and I'm happy to help make sure that these things get filled. Uh, I think we can agree the chat is going to be in very good hands going forward for the next year. The installation of the executive and the board will take place uh, on May 21st at our May chapter meeting. And I hope to see you all there. Thank you. Thank you very much, Steve. And thank you to all of the nominees for your ongoing commitment and your contribute, contribution to the chapter. I'd like to call upon Adrian Matani to discuss an upcoming day event.
this room, especially in our, in our leadership roles that, uh, that, were, that, were that have happened to that, that leadership event. But we had him here to come to do um, more general business development training. And that, that was a big hit. We get uh, 30 people out, uh, master's person. Really appreciate that. And um, tomorrow, uh, since we have Mr. Barney uh, Olson town, he's going to talk about design uh, the European way, which actually you should uh, fit in well with our tech session for those who participated in that. So uh, that'll be in the HTS office for those who are attending. Don't go to the master's, uh, the master's classroom. So see you there tomorrow. Thank you. I would like to call upon somebody from Total HVAC to uh, talk about the tabletop. Hello again. Um, my name is Steve Moons, and I'm one of the owners of Total HVAC. And tonight we're happy and proud to present uh, a long range of heating and cooling panels. Uh, we thought it fitting given the evening's presentation. Uh, Twelve is a veteran manufacturer out of Edmonton that we've been representing for more than 20 years with uh, quite a bit of success. And one of the interesting things about Twelve, what it can do uh, quite thoroughly, is a lot of variation, a lot of flexibility in what you want to do with the panel. So, certainly a standard uh, 24 inch radiant heat and cooling panel is an option, but beyond that, there's a lot of architectural flexibility uh, that we can offer when it comes to the look of the panel, the type of the panel, the dimensions, integrating. Uh, lights, uh, sprinklers, diffusers, it becomes very much a part of the architectural aspect of the whole design. So uh, overall, I think we can all agree that better communication between disciplines is a good thing, and this is a product that uh, helps to get the architects where they need to go with a lot of flexibility. So uh, please drop by, I'm happy to talk about it in a little more detail. We have some sample panels, sample colors, different uh, finishes that you're welcome to look at. If you have any more questions, feel free to call the office and we can help you out. And at this point, I'd like to call upon Andrew Duma to uh, come to the stage just, just to uh, share some news. Uh, thanks, Dan. Um, unfortunately, I'm here to uh, announce that after a year long battle with that brain cancer, Ed Cassidy had passed away during the early mornings uh, today, or early morning hours today. He was uh, one of the co founders of Total H back, way back in 1996, and I know many people in this room uh, knew him. He was uh, a very capable salesman, a uh, very capable business owner, and served the company very well for over 23 years. Um, obviously, he's going to be greatly missed by, by not only our team, but I'm sure by, by the industry. Uh, he didn't attend as many ASHRAE events uh, or meetings in the last number of years, but going back 10, 15, I'm sure 20 years, he was uh, a regular attendee, and you certainly would have recognized him by his, uh, his big smile and his contagious laugh. Um, the wake is scheduled for this Friday, we don't have hours just yet. Uh, the funeral is going to be scheduled for, um, for Saturday at 11 a.m. at the Memorial Chapel of Gardens, I believe, on Prince of Wales. Uh, the information will be available on our website as well, totalhvac.com. Um, we ask that you keep uh, Ed's family, his, uh, his wife Linda, his daughter Megan, and his son Tyler in your, in your thoughts and prayers as they uh, go through what I'm sure is a very, very difficult time. Thank you. Thank you very much, Andrew. Uh, we are going to move into the dinner service, and uh, Sandy, if you would please just tap the tables, it's a buffet, and uh, when Sandy tells you you can eat, you can eat. If she doesn't tell you you can eat, please stay with your seat. Maybe Ryan, you can go for a little bit. Thank you.
Now, what, why are we interested in uh, radiant heating and cooling? It has to do with the temperature we are using for uh, providing heating or removing heat uh, from our buildings. So often we, we talk about low temperature heating and high temperature cooling. Because if you use large surfaces for the heat exchange, you can go with temperatures which are getting closer to the space temperature you want. So what we are talking about for heating is temperatures in the range 25 to 40 degrees centigrade. In modern low energy buildings it's even lower. And for cooling, for most of the system we are talking about a range from 16 to 23 degrees. So you see, they are pretty close to the room temperatures that we want. And there are many uh, systems that uh, we call uh, rating, heating and cooling, and I'm going to talk a little about them and some of the basic the boundary condition, the limitations, and give several examples of building from around the world. So by having a temperature range which are more narrow or closer to space temperature, we get higher efficiency of our systems. Now our heat pumps or COP value, condensing for our boiler for heating, ground cold, we can use more of the waste heat and also solar uh, energy. And for the cooling, Again, we can use ground cobble, sometimes directly without having any uh, heat pump in between. I'll show you some examples of that. More opportunities to use uh, free cooling, basically to get, to get more advantage of uh, uh, natural energy sources. When we today talk about rating systems, normally when we have tried to define them in, in uh, in standard, it is systems where more than half of the heat exchange is by radiation. It's not like you don't see any rate in systems that has 100% energy change by radiation. There's always uh, some uh, conviction. But more than half should be by radiation, then we will uh, call it like a radiant uh, system. You can either have panels. Uh, we can have what we call surface system or embedded system. So let me try to show you how we distinguish between those. So suspended uh, ceiling panels uh, has been used for, for many years. So you have a panel suspended under the ceiling where you on the back side have piping to circulate uh, uh, warm or cool uh, water. So supply or remove heat uh, from the uh, space. It can be a full uh, ceiling. Sometimes you also see them that they are used as an additional heating and cooling and only covering part of the ceiling. Today we see uh, a type of panels uh, like uh, gypsum boards where you have a thin piping integrated in the gypsum board so they are pretty easy to install. We even see applications where you have very thin, called the capillary tubes, about five uh, millimeters, which you can put in the plaster, and that's uh, uh, very well suited for if you do a renovation and want to have a rating system and want to use, for example, the whole uh, ceiling. When we now go to the systems where we have embedded some of the piping for the, the transfer of energy, we only distinguish between systems which are insulated from the main structure of the building, like most typical floor heating. You have uh, pipes embedded uh, in the street, but it could also be in a wooden construction, and then it's uh, insulated from the main structure of the building. And similarly, it could be used for wall system and uh, ceiling system. So it's a little different from the suspended ceiling panels because you don't have any air gaps here. And that's important for how we determine the capacity. For those systems, we can use about the same uh, formulas, but for 
suspended ceiling panels, uh, it normally requires a test, at a test place to get the data from the uh, uh, heat and cooling capacity. And then we have a system which uh, has uh, grown in application since uh, we did really the first one in, in the end of the 90s. And that is in the main construction slabs, in multi-story building, you integrate piping in, in the middle of the slab or in, inside the concrete uh, between the upper and lower reinforcement. And why do you do that? That's because you want to use this slab as a storage. And the advantage with having a storage is that you can uh, reduce peak load and you may transform, transfer some of the needs uh, for removing or uh, supplying energy from daytime to nighttime. Especially it is relevant for cooling. So we see very much for building who want to have some cooling and don't want to have a full air conditioning, they apply this type of system. And I'll come back to uh, uh, how that uh, will work. So one thing is the, heat, the, the capacity of uh, making heat and cooling systems. And that relates to the heat transfer coefficient that uh, you have. And here we have a di uh, difference. Between the different systems where you have the pipes embedded, the way you calculate the heat transfer in, uh, in the structure follow the same rules, but the difference is at the heat exchange at the surface. So if we take a floor and uh, we warm it up so it's warmer than the room, we can go up to a heat exchange coefficient about uh, uh, 11. Half of this Five and a half watts per square meter per degree is radiation. And the radiant part of the heat exchange, or the radiant part of the heat exchange coefficient, is the same if you have a ceiling, if you have a floor, if you have a wall. But the convective part changes. And if you have a warm floor, the air will get a little warmer around the floor and it will rise, warm air rises, so you have a significant amount of convection also from the heated floor. But if you have a cool floor, you don't have this uh, convection. So out of the 7 watts per square meter per degree heat change coefficient, about 80%, 5.5 is radiation. So that's uh, mainly radiation. If you have a ceiling, it's the other way around that for the ceiling you have a high heat exchange coefficient uh, for cooling because the colder air will uh, fall down and you have a higher convective part. So you could say for the same delta T between the surface and the room, the floor is better for heating, the ceiling is better for uh, cooling. There are some different applications but that rules not always uh, is the valid outshot. For all, the heat exchange coefficient is the same if you are heating or cooling. Now, the other factor is how low or how high temperatures on your surface is acceptable. And here, some of those are limited because of comfort. And as I told you, my study when I did my PhD was related to what temperatures on the floor are still comfortable for people. And for the uh, upper uh, level, uh, it would be around 29 degrees that people will choose. Uh, so today, uh, when you design a floor heating system, you cannot go to a higher floor temperature than 29 degrees for the designing. That means most of the year it will be lower. Uh, for cooling, uh, we could, depending on if you are standing or sedentary, go down to a 19, as we say in SA stand up. But I recommend not lower than 20 for sedentary person. So when we have floor cooling, it's not uh, like the core floor is very cool, it's only go down to about 20 degrees. Now for the uh, in the, the, the standards there are those uh, ISO standards, European standards for uh, these rate and heat and cooling systems, uh, it is allowed in the perimeter with our first meter, half meter from the outside uh, facade to have a higher temperature on the floor uh, because it's really outside the occupied zone and sometimes uh, if your window construction is not very good uh, you want to have a little more heating uh, that part. 
For the ceiling, we don't have any uh, parts that are of the body which are in, in contact with the ceiling. So here, the limitations for the uh, healing part is the rate of the symmetry. People don't like to have a warm head and cold feet. The other way around, cold head and warm feet is fine. Uh, so there are some limitations to how high temperature that they will accept uh, from above. So normally the upper limit in a normal room is somewhere around 27 to 30 degrees. But we have a method where you can calculate this asymmetry. For the cooling part, as I said, people are not so sensitive if you have a cool radiation from above. So here the limiting will be the dew point. I have put it here at 17 degrees, but it depends, of course, uh, what uh, humidity low you have on the building. And for the wall, uh, again, for cooling, it will be the dew point. And, and there's discussion how high temperature can we get to on the wall. And normally we do not have uh, contact with the wall. Pain limit, if you have contact with the surface, is about 43 degrees centigrade. But the wall should not be too warm also because of the heat loss to the back side. So there's no fixed really limit for that. Uh, I recommend normally you no know, higher than 40. So now we can sort of say, okay, here are some limitations. Uh, some are based on comfort. And we know the heat exchange coefficient. And now we can say, okay, now if we have the design room temperature, we can give some boundary condition mm -hmm. for how much uh, heat exchange is uh, possible. And if we take a floor heating, normally in, in many countries uh, your design indoor temperature for heating is 20 degrees centigrade. And uh, we could go up to 29 degree on the floor, so that's a delta T of 9 times the uh, heat exchange coefficient of 11. So it's about 9900 watts per square meter as, as the limit. And for the cooling, normally we design many places our cooling system so we can provide 26 degree and not higher temperature than 26 degree uh, and floor temperature we could go down to 20 so that's a delta T of 6 times the heat exchange coefficient of 7 that gives you a 42 watts per square and the same you can do for the others so for the ceiling you could go up to 100 watts per square meter for cooling and down to about 40 for so that's how you come to a kind of a boundary uh, uh, condition for your system. If you want to see uh, how much uh, heat output or how much uh, heat you can remove, uh, the manufacturers may have diagrams or calculations you can go in depending on uh, uh, pipe distance uh, <coughs> uh, and the delta T between your water and the room and find uh, what is the heat exchange. I'm not going to and nowadays also you can do, use a finite element, a finite difference method, build up your, your structure here, floor heating uh, with a pipe. Uh, it will be at your back here, because next you have another pipe here. So in between here we assume it's at your back. And then you can calculate what are the heat exchange, surface temperature. And this is today uh, programs that are not so expensive uh, to use. And these are often used uh, to evaluate uh, systems. So I talked about the floor uh, cooling were limited to about 40 watts per square meter. There's one exception. I'll show some uh, uh, project where that has uh, been a big advantage. And that is if you have uh, a lot of glass, uh, like in a uh, foyer, uh, entrance hall, or an atrium where you may have a lot of diffuse or direct sunshine on the floor, then you can remove more than 100 watts per square meter. So in these applications, the floor system is very uh, efficient. Also for heating in the, in the winter, because you get pretty uniform uh, temperature distribution in these cases. So these systems, uh, which are in the surface of the structure are now be calculated like on a more or less steady state uh, condition when you do the uh, dimension. 
But if you go to systems where we now integrate the piping in the thermal mass, then it gets very dynamic. And often here you will need to do a, a, a computer simulation to look at the performance. Well, let me just show uh, an, an example of what the idea behind such a system is, uh, where we have a multi-story building, piping integrated between upper and lower reinforcement. You have free access to the concrete, no suspended ceiling. Uh, on the floor, you probably have acoustic uh, <coughs> insulation, and also you may have a base floor to have cables and other things. So most of the heat exchange is assumed to be over the ceiling. So the idea is, when you look at this uh, graphic here, that's the 24 hours, uh, in an office, uh, people come in in the morning, then uh, turn on lights, and other maybe, depending on the window, right? and then the load gets higher and higher because of sunshine, and then you have a peak here for your cooling system. So we are mainly using now, I'm mainly talking about the cooling. So when you then design your uh, full air system, you would normally design it for the peak load uh, you have. Then people are leaving and there's no sunshine anymore, the load comes down. So when we now have a hydronic system to remove some of this uh, heat, uh, the goal is then that you should have a system that can remove the same heat as what was introduced for the internal loads from people and from uh, uh, external. So we basically have to remove the same as the uh, area under this curve. And what is done is really by the combination of the two systems. We need a doors, a ventilation system for indoor air quality, but here we can do some of the cooling. So during daytime, we are running the cooling on the uh, air uh, system so we may remove some of the heat here. But you see this area is smaller than the whole area, so we are not removing all of it. That also means we are not controlling the temperature at a fixed level. We will have the temperature floating in this uh, space, it will drift. Then, during that time, uh, heat will be absorbed in the concrete slab, and then when people are gone during night time, we can cut down on the ventilation and now we make the cooling on the water side. So we are removing now this heat that has been absorbed. So in the morning, uh, we should have this area under this curve here should be higher than what was uh, generated. And what you see now, the peaks are much smaller. So you can design your system with uh, a, a smaller peak values, which are important, first of all, for the load of the whole system, uh, also on the grid, but it's also important for sizing your equipment. So that's uh, uh, the, the idea by having a thermal mass where you can store some of the heat during the day and then you can cool it down during the night time. And as I said, the temperatures then during the day if we have a comfort range, it has been, the, the trick is then to show that we will float or drift within the comfort range. And normally when we use a uh, European standard or ASRA is somewhere between 23 to 60, 26 degrees. And we have done studies and uh, that doesn't deteriorate people's comfort. It's fully acceptable as long as you will in that uh, level. Now, how do you control the uh, radiant heat and cooling system? Uh, in most cases, uh, when we now this is a little complicated because it's both heating and cooling. But in most cases, what you do when you do the heating part, uh, you have an uh, outside uh, temperature sensor, and you may have a heating curve. So depending on the outside temperature, you find out what should be the supply water temperature to your uh, house the zone in the building. And that's all how you uh, control it. And then in each room, uh, that's some required in European countries, it is required 
that each room has its own thermostat, both for reducing energy use but also for comfort. So normally now we have uh, wireless sensors, a room sensor, uh, send a signal to a valve, and now we don't need any more heating, and close the valve. And that's normally how the, uh, the heating is controlled. If you now have cooling, you have a chiller, it's basically the same. You may also have some change according to outside uh, the temperature. But what you also need here is you have to have a humidity sensor. Because you want to avoid that you get compensation, for example, on the floor, if you have a floor cooling, but concept is the same if you have a, a, a radiant the ceiling. So by measuring the dew point in the space, uh, you can make sure that your supply water temperature does not go below dew point. And if the supply water temperature is below dew point, all other temperatures in the system will be high. So you avoid uh, any compensation. Now, some people uh, will say that those systems here are very slow. Because uh, even if you have a floor heating in the screen, uh, you have a certain mass, especially if you have what they call a tap system where you have a whole uh, concrete slab to control. But here you have to look at what is it you want to control for. If you want to have a space where you were uh, two hours in the morning want a 20 degree and then two hours later you want to have 25, then it's not the system to use, because then it's very slow. Then you have to warm up the whole uh, screen or concrete. But in most cases what we want, we want the system to compensate for changes in internal loads from sunshine or for people. And here the systems are very efficient, because the temperature difference, here are some values from the floor here, the temperature difference between the floor and the room is in most cases in well-designed building only a couple of degrees. So just one degree change, for example, a higher room temperature will decrease the heat output from 30 percent. So there is a very a significant level of what we call self-control, and that means uh, it is not really a slow uh, system. We have several data on that. I'm not sure that, but you have to distinguish between compensating for changes in internal loads compared to wanting to change the, the temperature in the space. So, uh, let me uh, show a little uh, how we evaluate, uh, uh, for example, this tap system where you have integrated the piping in the, the whole construction. Um, you do a simulation of a building here, an office building, you can have a rest uh, East room or south or north, uh, you define uh, two people, maybe and, uh, you define what windows you have, the internal loads, uh, you put it to your simulation, and then we want to look at how well can we control the temperature in this office. And uh, we look then at different ways of controlling. So the maximum cooling you can provide is by having the supply water temperature equal to the dew point. Uh, that's the maximum we can obtain. But normally, as you will see, this is not a good idea. Uh, we need to control the supply water temperature uh, as a function of external temperature. And in some cases, it could also be a function of internal temperature. And then some of the factors of control that have some algorithms they are using. We could also think about, I'll show you one building where we tried that, to run with the same constant temperature the whole year round. For example, if you want to keep a, uh, a space around 20 degrees uh, the whole year round, then, <coughs> no, around, sorry, if you, you want to have a, a space where we will have about 20 degrees uh, during uh, winter time, and 24 during the summertime, and then you run the system at 22 degrees the whole year, then in wintertime you will heat the 22, in summertime you will cool the 22. But that depends very much on uh, the building. Now to evaluate the effect of controlling, uh, we use 
what is the comfort, so what range of operative temperature do we get in the space, how often is the pump running, because that's the electrical energy, and what is the energy uh, use. Uh, other simulations and practice have shown that we do not need to run the system uh, the whole time. So very often we recommend just do it during night time to have this shift in loads. So if we now have these different ways of controlling, here we are trying to cool as much as possible. So the supply temperature when needed is the same as the dew point. It's uh, uh, summertime in, I think it was in the south, southern part of Germany. Uh, and these values for temperatures, percentage uh, is the range uh, green here is 22 to 25 uh, degrees. So it's relatively comfortable. We were saying that we don't need any uh, cooling as long as the room temperature doesn't go above 23 degrees. So there was not so that the pump was running the whole time. What we see here, if you have the maximum cooling, here you have the running time of the pump, but it really gets too cold sometimes. We have 15% where it's lower than 22 degrees, and that would often be too cold for, uh, for many people in summertime. Then if we control according to external temperature uh, in different ways, we can really reduce the pump running time and the comfort is not worse, we may now get up to 26 degrees. But very most of the time we are in the comfort range. But when we then look at the energy use, and what we see here when we try to run this system at too low temperatures, for example the dew point all the time, we have to reheat. So the system has so much mass that we have to be careful not to have water temperature uh, varying too much. And that's the case here when it's always equal to the dew point. We are cooling a lot, but we are also heating. This goes up even further. But you see now, if we have a better control uh, according to outside temperature, we uh, reduce the uh, uh, cooling. Uh, we may have a little when we do heating now, it's from May to September. Uh, and we also uh, see that uh, depending on what we are controlling, the supply of water or the average between supply and return, we can also reduce the pump running time. So that's how you can use a computer simulation to evaluate your control and see if you will be in, in comfort uh, during the, the summertime. So now we go into some uh, uh, Examples. One of the big uh, or the critical uh, issues when you have to install in the concrete slab in the building is that the HVAC has to be involved from the beginning. You cannot wait install your system until the building is made because you have to get pipes in the slab. If you have a suspended ceiling or floor heating, uh, uh, then uh, you don't have to be there uh, from the beginning. And the installations uh, of, uh, of suspended uh, uh, radiant uh, cooling uh, panels or floor heating is well known from the manufacturer, so, so that's not really the issue. But if you want to have piping in the concrete structure, uh, you uh, have some issues. And with the first building I was involved with, the big issue was, if you come now with piping, at the same time they are putting in the reinforcement for the concrete, uh, for, for the concrete, when you uh, cast the concrete on, on in situ, on site, and if you delay their work, they will increase their hourly price for doing it, and the building owner will not like that. So what was done was to deliver the piping like uh, mod modules, uh, 15, 16 square meters at one time uh, that could be put down. And it turned out after some practice that it worked really well. So there has not really been an issue uh, uh, regarding delay of the uh, construction. Of course, the piping, uh, as you can 
can see people when they walk on the piping, but normally most of the time you're using uh, pigs piping and they are pretty strong, uh, so you can walk on them, it doesn't uh, necessarily uh, give a problem, but very often of course you have to do a pressure test. So before, when you now have installed the piping between the reinforcement, you do a pressure test to make sure everything is tight. And also after you have put the concrete, you do a pressure test. So that's uh, uh, very important. After that, then the pipes are really protected and nothing can happen. Until somebody was so stupid that did a pressure test in winter and forgot to take out the water, and uh, the uh, pipes were destroyed. The structure was fortunately not destroyed. And the uh, manufacturer of the pipe was happy now they sold another system again. <laughs> but there was a long, uh, a long discussion who was responsible. At that time I was in the industry, but in our uh, handbook it was saying, don't do the uh, pressure test in the window with water, do it with air or make sure to take out the water again. So we were not hurt. Nowadays uh, we see uh, some countries they use more prefabrication, uh, so you can find uh, producers uh, definitely in uh, North Europe where they produce these uh, concrete slabs and pipes that are integrated. I know that in the Netherlands, we also have in Denmark where the pipes are being integrated. At the, uh, uh, at the production of the slab. So, let me talk a little about uh, radiant uh, floor cooling. Uh, floor heating, I think, is so well known and, and proven system and known in a lot of places. But not many people know that you can basically, with the same system, you can also do cooling. Uh, this is being done, especially where we as I mentioned, where you may have some higher rate of loads on the floor, you can really remove a significant amount of uh, uh, energy. So where we have seen it being used, we have an opera house in Copenhagen that used uh, floor cooling shopping centers and museums. But the biggest project uh, uh, was the airport in, uh, in Bangkok, uh, the new airport that was built in 2000. 2004. There, the architect, and uh, in the talk earlier today, we talked about too many windows. <laughs> well, he put a lot of windows in, uh, in this construction. So, all the concourses here at the airport, the roof consists of half of it was uh, glass, and the other half was like a, a double layer of plastic membrane. So you can imagine in Bangkok, where it gets over 40 degrees very often, and you have a lot of sunshine, that the load here in the concourses was very high. And to use a full air system uh, would cost a lot of energy. So the design that was uh, done was to integrate uh, piping in the floor, you may not be able to see it, but here the piping are put in all the floors in the concourses and it's combined the floor cooling, you see here, with the displacement uh, ventilation, so we get a stratification uh, in the space. Uh, this was tested by CFD calculation uh, to get this stratification. So up here, you could have temperatures about 40, the same as uh, outside. And we even did testing in a big uh, tennis hall because one of the arguments was yes, if people start moving, you will destroy this uh, uh, certification. So we did testing in a big uh, uh, tennis hall and it would not be destroyed even if people were moving uh, down here. What happened, however, who destroyed it was. And sometimes they want to save in construction material, so they decided to make it lower. So they decreased the height of this, which means they would be pressing down the warm temperature down here. 
And exactly up here is where they built the duty-free uh, area. <laughs> so they had to put in a lot of uh, air conditioning up in this area because of that. But that shows you when we do change something in the construction, all partners should really be there to evaluate and not only one of them. So the, the, the concept is then to have a 30 degree supply of water temperature and 90 degree uh, return to keep the floor at about 21 degrees. The air system uh, was an air change of about 4 and it was supplied at air temperature of uh, 16, 18 degrees. It was done something with the uh, uh, with the roof here to avoid some of the solar radiation. First of all, the, the glass was uh, fritted so it would reflect some of the sunshine. And that meant you could not really look out so well there. But down here it was not fritted. And that's normally where people they look out so it was not really a problem. And you don't have the sun shining so low uh, in, in Bangkok. So that was done to uh, reflect some of the sunshine. But then on the inside, it was also put a membrane, a low E coating. So a kind of a pool of floor was reflected in the ceiling, and that also helped on the, uh, on the comfort. I don't know what happened after seven years if it gets dirty, because then you know the uh, the low heat coating is not working anymore. Uh, I'm not sure how they cope with that. So that was the uh, idea uh, of the construction. So what they uh, the design calculated, the uh, design engineers, was if we were going to have, as usual, full air system, uh, the total load would be like uh, 709 kilowatt hours per square meter a year. But by having a major part of the energy removed by a water-based system and by the floor cooling, they could reduce the energy use with about 30 percent. And that was something to do with uh, you didn't have to cool down the water so much and also to transport the energy with water that was more efficient than with air. So when you see here then that the piping has been included, and here you see the big uh, displacement Users. They are about, I think they're like 180 times 140, so they're very uh, large. So one discussion was then, yes, but now we have 13, we want to have 13 degrees supply temperature of the water. What about compensation on the pipe? Do we have to put uh, in the manifold here, do we have to insulate so we avoid we have a lot of compensation? But what was decided was to put in the manifold for the distributor to the different uh, circuits inside the supply diffusers. Because the air coming in here would be 18 or 16 degree and the dew point was 10 degree. The goal was to keep a dew point of 16 degree in the airport. So it's still 5 degree lower than the a minimum floor temperature of 21. And to do that, they have a supply at a dew point of 10 degrees, which is lower than the supply water temperature of 30. So you have no risk for getting compensation. And that's why you avoid the cost to, to have insulation on the pipe. So this is a kind of extreme case of, of the use of floor heating, but it shows even in human errors, if you do it correctly, you can use it. As I mentioned, in, in the Danish uh, Opera House, yeah, and of course in Bangkok, it was never used for heating. That is only for cooling. In most cases, when you have a, a floor cooling, you often have floor heating. That's the most economical. So in the Danish Opera House, uh, outside the foyers, we have floor heating and cooling. Uh, many uh, exhibition uh, area, here for a car company in Germany, also used for heating and, and cooling. Now, when we now go to the, uh, the TAPS uh, system, I'll show a couple of examples of that. And one of those, were, one of the first one was an art museum in uh, Austria. Uh, architect was Peter Sumtow, uh, 
a Swiss uh, architect. And uh, it's a three or four story building. It has a, like a double facade. The other facade is glass. Uh, but in between there was concrete uh, walls. And the design requirement, because it was an art museum, was you could not have uh, too fast air temperature changes uh, during the day. It could vary within 4 degrees. And you wanted to design the room temperature from 18 to 22 in winter and 22 to 26 in summer. Uh, and here there were then piping integrated in the floors and in the walls. And if you look at a drawing here, you see so piping has been installed here, here. But you see also here is shown a glass roof above the exhibition area. So it looks like this, and it's a transparent, it's like a milky glass. And the idea was that the artificial lighting would be above, so you never had some direct lights in the exhibition area. And also sunshine would come in here, and you would not have direct sunshine down in the exhibition area. But what was done was that the the air for the ventilation system, the exhaust was taken from this part, which was some of the warmest uh, in the space. But by going by uh, this uh, hydronic uh, removal, both for heating and cooling, you could avoid a lot of air. I think they could reduce, yeah, instead of having uh, for each story uh, 75,000 cubic meters per hour, we only need. 750 cubic meter per hour by doing most of the heating and cooling by a hydraulic system. The, uh, at that time, uh, we didn't use so much uh, <coughs> uh, uh, heat pumps, so it was a condensing gas boiler that did the heating. But the cooling was made by a ground source heat engine and no uh, uh, chiller or heat pumps involved because pipe were embedded also in the foundation. Uh, so by circulating down to the foundation with pipe integrated here, we could have a storage tank where we could have about 14 degrees, and that was enough to do the cooling. So the only cost for the cooling was really running the circulation pump. So nowadays we see uh, in Europe often that uh, small offices, uh, they use a tap system, piping integrated in the concrete slab for uh, storage possibility to lower the peak and transfer some of the need from daytime to night time. Uh, the buildings are normally, uh, the facades uh, are well constructed. You have to use a little more time on the design to keep down the loads. That's important then, because this system, there are limitations in how much it can so a well-designed building is, uh, is needed. Uh, also, when you have a lot of big windows, a lot of sunshine, you have to look at uh, solar uh, shade. So in this uh, building here, when we look at the system, they had a tap uh, system and they had a ground source uh, heat pump. But what was done was for the heating, uh, they used the ground source heat pump. But for the cooling, the heat pump was bypassed because the ground temperature was uh, low enough to produce uh, temperature 16, 70 degrees for the cooling. Uh, there was done uh, several uh, measurements in the building. I'll, I'll show one here where you had the outside temperature during the summer up to 30 something. And here the temperatures in the different rooms are somewhere between 22 and 26 degrees. We have seen another one in Madrid. Uh, they lower the energy use of that building uh, more than 60% lower than uh, the normal type of offices uh, uh, built in uh, Madrid. But the only building, the only comparison, where you have a direct comparison of VAD and Radian, is a building that has been published also in SRA. Uh, it was a building in uh, India where they, uh, uh, it's an engineering company and they decided to have a full scale test. So they had a VAV at one side of the building and 
integrated in the, the concrete slab. And then they measured over several years the uh, energy use and they have a third party to evaluate also the, uh, <coughs> the comfort were evaluated. And what, what you can look at is that in this part of the building where you don't have the suspended ceiling, you have free access up to the concrete, uh, you can have a higher room, which also means you can have more benefit of daylight because you can get more daylight into the room compared to if you have a suspended ceiling uh, with a ductwork. Because if you do most of the cooling by a hydronic system, you, you need much smaller ducts and you can run them in the, in the hallway. The other thing is, if you don't want to have the advantage of a higher room, but you want to have a standard height, and then in multi-story building, for each story you save about 60, 70 centimeters of the building materials, uh, and, and that's like you could say an economical benefit. So when you then measured uh, these two, which, as I said, according to the Indian standard, both sides were very well uh, designed, uh, we still had about 30 percent lower. Uh, energy use in the uh, building with the uh, rated uh, system. Okay. Lastly, uh, now this uh, the use of, for example, this tap system and rating system has been increasing, especially the tap system in multi-story office building in Europe, Germany, Belgium, Netherlands, and also in Denmark. Uh, there's also a building here in Canada uh, who is using this uh, principle. And now they have also uh, started in, in uh, Japan. Uh, the Japanese have now been much more focused on energy efficiency after they had the problem with one of the nuclear plants. The uh, government is very focused on making more energy efficient buildings and systems. Here's one building uh, which uh, last year won the ASRAE uh, award. Uh, it has a uh, uh, rated heating and uh, cooling. Most of the time it's uh, cooling because of internal uh, loads. Uh, and the principle here is a rated uh, panel in most of the uh, office. But then at the perimeter, where you may have some higher load from sunshine, they combine it with a chill beam. So you know, the chill beam is basically a fan coil to put up in the sea. And the advantage is here that the water temperature you will need for the radio panel and the chill beam are basically the same. So you can run it with the same uh, water temperature. So uh, that's how they have made the, their panels. And then I said the perimeter, they also have a uh, <coughs> chill beam. And they have also done measurement in the documentation. Uh, for ASRAE, there's also measurement on the and last year, they just opened the first building in Japan also. Now, the TAP system, where you have integrated pipe in the concrete uh, slab. Uh, they did calculations on uh, normally what would they have a peak load, then if they did a good design, and then if they use the TAP system, how they could get down with a peak load. And uh, their ceiling looked a little different than we normally see. They had a kind of special uh, concrete ceiling here and so they put the piping here in between here was used also for air uh, but also for, uh, for lighting and right now I think that will be submitted also for an ASRAE award and right now they are I hear that they very, have been very uh, successful satisfied both with the energy use uh, but also with the indoor line but measurements are being uh, done right now so it is a system, even if you are in a humid area, uh, if you do a well design and make sure to dehumidify uh, when it's necessary and have a control and take that into account, then it, it is useful also in, in more humid areas. So here at the end, why is low temperature heating and light, uh, high temperature cooling uh, an advantage? It's a water-based system and it's more economical to move heat by the water because water has a higher heat capacity uh, than air. 
So you just use a small diameter of pipe instead of a duct. That's something the architect loves a lot. They don't have to have space for all the ducting. And the electrical consumption for the circulation pump pump will be much lower than for the fans. And as you're not moving so much air around, uh, normally the noise level would be uh, lower, less risk uh, for draft. For the tap system, you could go with a lower building height, increase efficiency of your energy plant. But there are some limitations to the capacity. So it's not like it's a system that's not the best of all. You have to look at the case by case. Uh, because if you have a lot of sunshine at a very high load, or you need a lot of humidification, then you might as well go for a full air system. So look at it from case uh, to case, uh, and especially the latter load you have to look at. And finally, acoustic, that has been one of the, uh, the discussions because if you have like a bare slab or if you have metal uh, rated panels and you don't have the same absorption that you normally have for a suspended ceiling. So some of the first uh, building I was involved in, they did uh, ways of absorbing some of the acoustic in other ways. Uh, you could put a carpet, but I would not recommend carpet, but uh, you can make furniture also wooden surfaces we have a higher surface area if you put a small hole in them so it absorb more of it. But we've also done some studies now that has been published in natural literature that the reduction of the capacity, even if you have some of the ceiling covered with acoustic, you cannot have it there with, with panels, acoustic panels, and it's not that high as, as we expected. You cannot have a full cover but you can have it so you have space between the uh, acoustic uh, baffles so the air uh, uh, can come down. And the best is if you turn them around so your acoustic baffle uh, goes uh, like this. So there are some ways uh, that you can do that. But the experience that I have heard, it has not been a big uh, issue with the acoustic. Thank you. That's all for me tonight. different 
Nobody told them that they were piping in the floor. So now they were expert in repairing pipes. <laughs> <laughs> they drilled so many holes. At some places, they got a diffuser in the middle of the store. I remember when I came there, they had put a lot of brochures on it, so no air was coming out. So they had to learn that. Then that can happen. Then you can repair. Do you have any suggested methods for demonstration? Perhaps techniques or equipment that you generally uh, would recommend? Well, it's. Uh, many are working now, especially some of those people are working in China, to use a desiccant, uh, desiccant cooling uh, as an efficient way. Uh, but uh, just by cooling the supply air, you, you can remove, but then you need. Uh, certain low temperature on this part where you want to cool down to get a low energy point and the move. Uh, <coughs> but as a desiccant, I think we will see more use of the desiccant uh, cooling, uh, des desiccant purification yeah. in, in the future. Yes? Uh, part I didn't catch there is that what your your air coming out from outside to inside. You diminify that air to the maximum to help your cooling system to lower down the dew point. Well, many of the uh, 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 constructions, for example, Opera House in Denmark, some of the offices are share old as many, so they don't uh, dehumidify. Okay. It, it's not that is not needed to dehumidify. But of course, in uh, when I showed you. In, in Tokyo, some in uh, Bangkok, the whole year round, they have to do the and especially in, in, in Bangkok. Yes. And the big problem, another big problem with the airport was it has to be tight. Uh, and after it was constructed, we went around and saw a lot of places where. Air will come in and then you can not control humidity. So it has to be, uh, uh, be as tight as possible. And then, of course, you can run with a little overpressure. But if it's not very tight, it's very difficult to get this overpressure. Because when, when the plane comes, of course, it opens somewhat to the outside. So you have a little overpressure, not to get too much uh, wet air inside.
need to uh, provide that information back to us. So thank you all very much for coming, and I wish you a good evening.